Well, the season over for another year, 2023 had a lot of changes to the WTA rankings and the WTA2 in general. After a season that was dominated by Sviantec, this season was a little bit different when it comes to the rankings. And now's the best time to go through a rankings recap from the start of the year all the way to the end and see what changed. Was what the rankings looked like at the start of 2023 with Sviantec on top by a long way of points. You can see they're 6,000 points ahead. But as we all know, things changed as the season progressed. And after the first week of the season, we had had Sabalenka winning in Adelaide, Goff won in Auckland, and the USA, without Goff, won the United Cup. There's only one change to the rankings, though, with Keys getting into the top 10, pushing Halep out of the top 10. And of course, we won't see Simona Halep for the entire season because she was banned, and she is banned until further notice. The second week of the season, we had Bencic winning in Adelaide, and that gave her a spot in the top 10 ahead of the Australian Open, going up three spots, pushing Keys out of the top 10 after just one week of getting there. And then the first Grand Slam of the year, the Australian Open, the big one, and Sabalenka winning her first Grand Slam title, winning the Australian Open, beating Rabakina in the final, and both got a boost in the rankings with Sabalenka going up three spots, Goff going up a spot, Bencic also got to go up a spot in the rankings, and Rabakina, she went up 15 spots into the top 10 for the first time in her career. Jabir, Pagula, Garcia, Zachary, and Kudamatova all dropping down the rankings. Despite some of them actually having a pretty decent Australian Open, they still all got overtaken. The first week of February, we had Garcia making the final of Leon, but that didn't affect the rankings at all. She didn't move in that top 10. We had no changes to the rankings. Then in the middle of February, we had Bencic winning another title, this time in Abu Dhabi, saving championship points against Samsonova and she didn't get a boost in the rankings, but she did get a lot of points for that win. But again, no changes to the rankings after this week. Sticking into the Middle East now, and Sviantec wins back-to-back -back in Doha, beating Pagula in the final, but with Sviantec way on top of the rankings, nothing changed for her, but Pagula did go up one spot, pushing Jabir down a spot in the rankings. So Pagula, again, solidifying herself in that top three. Then the end of February, we did have a lot of changes to the points, but no changes to the actual spots of the top 10 with players like Sviantec, Goff, and Pagula all getting good results in Dubai, but we didn't have any changes to the rankings after this week. Then the first week of March, Garcia makes another final, this time in Monterey, but again, doesn't change her position in the top 10, and in fact, nobody changes their position in the top 10, ahead of the Sunshine Double, which comes up in the next week. Then after Indian Wells, one of the biggest events outside of the slams, Rabakina, she wins the whole thing, wins Indian Wells, her first Masters 1000 or WTA 1000 title. And she got a boost in the rankings as well, going up three spots along with Garcia, who went up one spot, pushing Jabir and Zachary down a few spots as well after they lost points from last year's Indian Wells event. And staying in America with the Sunshine Double in Miami this time in Kvitova. She wins the Miami Open, beating Rabakina in the final. So again, Rabakina just keeps making these big finals. And she did get a boost in the ranking, Kvitova as well, going up two spots, with Zachary also going up a spot, pushing Bencic down two spots after she lost a lot of points from the 2022 Miami Open where she made a deep run. Then we head onto the clay courts for the first time in 2023, and Jabir, she wins in Charleston on the green clay in America. And that gave her a boost in the rankings as well. She went up one spot, pushing Garcia down one spot. So a nice start for Jabir to start off the clay court season, but unfortunately, it wouldn't last forever. We then went to the Billie Jean King Cup where nobody changed in the rankings because, of course, that's not worth any points on the WTA. So there was no changes to the rankings. Then on to Stuttgart, one of the most prestigious events outside of the Grand Slams and the 1000 events. And Sviantec, she wins again in Stuttgart, goes back to back, beats Sabalenka in that final. The first one-two battle we've had for the year, but it won't be the last. And again, because Sviantec had so many points, there was no change to her ranking and no change at all to any of the players in the top 10 after the Stuttgart Open. In the first 1,000 event on clay, we go to Madrid and Sabalenka. She beats Sviantec in the final, gets her revenge and gets another big trophy for her this year. This is her third trophy of the season, but unfortunately wasn't enough to get that number one position. But there were players that did go up with Garcia, Goff, Rabakina and Sakri all going up a spot. Kazakina and Jabir dropped down and mainly because Jabir was injured, had to pull out of the event, losing all her points from winning the event 12 months earlier. She actually got injured in Stuttgart and unfortunately that really did affect her rank and you'll see throughout the season until she came back, she was really affected with injury this year. Then we head on to Rome with a surprise winner, Rabakina, winning on clay. Maybe a surprise. She's had such a good season so far. She wins in Rome. She goes up two spots, 
going into that top four ahead of the French Open, which means she'll be a top four seed for the first time at a slam. She did overtake Garcia and Goff, who got pushed down the rankings a little bit ahead of the French Open. And that's what the seedings would look like going into the second slam of the year. Going into the week before the French Open, there were no changes to the rankings because none of the players played before the French Open this year. And then the second slam of the year, Iga Fiontek. She wins the French Open for a third time in four years and is able to keep that number one spot because the gap is starting to close between her and Sabalenka at this point. So she gets to keep that number one spot. Rabakina, Garcia, Jabir, Kvitova, and Hadaj Maya all getting a boost up in the rankings with Pagula, Goff, and Kazakina dropping down the rankings after losing points from 12 months ago. But... Sviontek Sabalenka, that is going to be a battle that we're going to talk about pretty much all year because it was a battle for the season. Very similar to the Djokovic Elkrez battle that happened on the men's side of things throughout 2023. Then onto the grass court for the first time this year and no changes to the top 10. Even though Zachary was playing in the tournament in Nottingham, there were no changes to the rankings for anybody in that first week. Then the second week of the grass court season and Kvitova, she wins in Berlin, but unfortunately wasn't enough points to get her a boost in the rankings. Pagula did get a boost in the rankings, pushed Pushing Garcia down to number five. And Krajikova, she jumped into the top 10. Sadaj Maya lost a lot of points from this time last year and she fell out of the top 10 after spending a couple weeks there post French Open. So that's what the seedings will look like going into Wimbledon. We did have some players playing before Wimbledon with Kazakina getting to the final of Eastbourne. Also, Goff and Sviontek getting to semi-finals of grass court events. But it was Kazakina who got into the top 10, pushing Krajikova out of the top 10 ahead of Wimbledon, the third slam of the year. Then Wimbledon happens for two weeks and Von Drusova, she wins her first grand slam, actually won her only title of the year. And that was at Wimbledon. Of course, points were given back to Wimbledon this year. So that means 2,000 points were on the line and they all went to Von Drusova. And she got a huge boost in the rankings. Kvitova also got a boost in the rankings going up one spot, but it was Von Drusova who went up 32 spots into the top 10 for the first time in her career. Zachary Kazakina had to go down in the rankings because of that boost, but it was one of the highest jumps into the top 10 of the season. And Von Drusova sitting at number 10 now after winning her first Grand Slam title. Then after Wimbledon, we had the Hopman Cup and also a couple of clay court events that none of the big names actually played, so there weren't too many changes in the rankings. But then we went onto the hard courts and Sviontek goes to Poland, wins in Warsaw, which was actually a hard court event this season. She wins the event, wins at home for the first time ever and got a nice little boost in the points, but of course, her number one ranking was still in her hands. We also had a change with Garcia dropping points from last year and Jabir overtaking her in the middle of the ranking. So there was a little bit of a change there as well. Then going into August, the US Open Series and Coco Goff. She starts her run, of course, had the coach Brad Gilbert coming on board. And this is where things started to change for Goff. She wins in Washington, her biggest title at the time. That'll be changing after a couple of weeks, but she does win Washington. Uh, both Pagula and Zachary also getting a boost in the rankings after having good weeks in Washington, pushing down Rebakina and Kvitova in the first week of the US Open Series. Then we head into Canada, the, one of the biggest events of the US Open Series, and Pagula beat Samson over in the final. Also beat Sviontek along the way, which is a huge win for her. She hadn't beaten Sviontek too many times before, and she gets the win. She wins in Canada, but there were no changes to the rankings, just a lot of changes to the points midway through the US Open Series. And then we we go to Cincinnati, arguably the biggest warm-up event of the US Open Series, and Goff, she wins again her biggest trophy at the time. Of course, that changes in a couple of weeks, spoiler alert. She beats Mooker in the final, also beats Fiontech for the first time along the way as well. So had a huge week winning that title, the biggest title of her career, and also got a boost in the rankings. Going up one spot, Von Drusova and Mukova also getting a boost in the rankings with Garcia and Kvitova dropping down the rankings. But Mukova into the top 10 for the first time after making the French Open final, also the final here, really starting to solidify herself in the top 10 as well. Then the week before the US Open, none of the big names played. Garcia did play in Cleveland, but there were no changes to the rankings ahead of the US Open. Open. And then the US Open, the final Grand Slam of the year, and Coco Goff does it again. Her biggest trophy officially now, until this day, is this US Open. She beat Sabalenka in the final. It was her title. She had the best US Open series of anyone. She's won three of the last four events that she's played, and she beat Sabalenka in that final, and she gets a huge boost in the rankings. But there was a change at the top as well, with Sabalenka finally getting to number one, because Sviontek, the defending champion of 2022, didn't make it past the fourth round, so she 
lost a lot of points. Sabalenka made the final. She gets to world number one. Goff also getting a boost in the rankings, going to world number three. Vondrusova Mukova, again, impressive this week, making the quarterfinals and semifinals of the US Open. They get a boost in the rankings. Sviantek's down one spot. Pagula went down two spots, as did Jabur. Zachary Garcia also dropping down the rankings, but it was all about Goff. It was all about Sabalenka this week, both getting career high rankings. Of course, Sabalenka getting to that number one spot finally. Then we had to San Diego and a little bit of the Asian swing as well, but nothing crazy happened. Only Krajikova winning in San Diego, which gave her back her spot in the top 10. She won at three spots. Pagula went up a spot as well because she didn't play and just got a little bit of a lucky, I guess, point situation. And after a terrible season, Garcia dropping out of the top 10 completely, which is a little bit of a shame because she finished 2022 so well. Then we go over to Mexico, Guadalajara. Nobody really played. And it was Zachary winning her first 1,000 title and her second career title after four years of not winning a title. She wins in Mexico. She lives her biggest trophy of her career. And she also got a boost in the rankings going up three spots. Garcia does make it back into the top 10 after having a very nice week in Guadalajara making the semis. So a little bit of form post-US Open for Garcia. But as we'll find out soon, it won't be enough. Vondrusova, Mukova, Krajikova all dropping down. So the Czech players all dropping after they skipped in Guadalajara. Then we head over to the Asian swing with Tokyo and Pagula making in the final, but it was Jabur who won the title in Ninbo, which was her second title of the year. Of course, having a lot of injuries this year, it was good to see her getting another win, but there were no changes to the rankings, only a change to the points of the top 10 players. Then heading over to the biggest event of the Asian swing in China, and Iga Sviantek winning her first 1,000 event of the year, which is so weird to say, because of course last year, she dominated most of the 1,000 events. This time, she only won one, and it was in Beijing. She beat Samson over in the final. Wasn't enough to get back to world number one, but it started a little bit of a momentum shift between her and Sabalenka. We'll talk about in a second. There were actually no changes in the top 10. Staying in Asia now, and Pagula, she won in Korea, winning another title this season. She'd already qualified for the WTA finals, but it was nice to get another title to her name, winning that title pretty easily in the end, but there were no changes to the top 10. Then heading into the final weeks of the WTA season, and there were three events on, but none of the big names played. All the points were taken away the week before the WTA finals started, and we did have some changes to the rankings because of those dropped points, with Pagula and Zachary dropping down the rankings, and Rabakina, Vondrusova, Mukova, and Krajikova getting a boost in the rankings because of the lost points from those players. Of course, Pagula and Zachary did play the WTA Finals last year, whereas the four players that got a boost didn't play, so they got a little bit of a benefit from that. Krajikova, she gets back into the top 10 after having a nice week at the Elite Trophy, which is kind of the second WTA Finals. It's actually not going to be an event next year, which is a shame, but it's for the players that are outside of the top 10 who didn't make the WTA Finals. Well, she won a couple of matches, and she got a boost and ended up in the top 10 to end the season. Then the final event of the year, the WTA Finals and Iga Sviantek had to win the event and hope that Sabalenka didn't do well and that's what happened. Sabalenka made the semis, Sviantek beat her along the way and then won the final and reclaimed the top spot in the very last match of the season. Had she lost the final, she wouldn't have been world number one. So by winning the WTA final, she also won the year-end championship or the year-end number one ranking as well. She overtakes Sabalenka at the last minute. We also had a little bit of a change in the middle with Jabur overtaking Von Drusova. So Jabur did come good towards the end of the season, but man, what a wild year for the ranking. So many things happening. And then the final event of the season, the Billie Jean King Cup, of course, not worth any points. Team Canada beat Italy in the final. Bit of an upset there, especially with countries like Kazakhstan, Switzerland, United States, even Poland and France playing. Canada reigned supreme, winning the Billie Jean King Cup, but it wasn't worth any points, so there was no change to the rankings, and that's what the rankings look like at the end of the 2023 season. But if we go back to the start of the season, Fiontech, she doesn't change her rankings, she stays on top. Jabur dropped down four spots, down to number six with an injury plague season. Did come good at the end of the year, but unfortunately lost all her points in the middle of the season where she gained them last year. Pagula she dropped down two spots to number five in the world, which is not too bad. Garcia, biggest drop out of everybody in the top 10 from the start of the year to the end. She drops down 16 spots to number 20 in the world, so she dropped out of the top 10 completely. Sabalenka, she went up to number two, with Zachary dropping down a couple of spots to number eight. Goff, of course, went up to number three in the world after winning that US Open. Kazakina, unfortunately, she drops out of the top 10, as does Kudamatova and Halep, and they made way for the Czech players, with Mukova, Vondrusova, and Krajikova getting into the top 10, replacing those couple of players. And of course, Rabakina. Who can forget her getting up into number four in the world? She was battling for that number three spot pretty much all season until Goff had that amazing US Open run. That is how the rankings look at the end of this year. How do you like the rankings? What was your favorite moment 
of the rankings this year. I love that one-two battle, and I love that Rebecca is finally getting some recognition. Of course, last year, she was the Wimbledon champion. It wasn't worth any points, and she wasn't in the top 10. In fact, she was outside the top 20 to start the year, and now she's at number four in the world, where she deserves to be. And hopefully next year, if she's healthy, she can start really pushing those top two ladies and maybe even be world number one with some crazy results. But let me know down in the comments below what has been your most exciting moment of the rankings this year. That is the rankings heading into the 2024 season, which happens in about a month's time.